I want to talk about the conformal training. So um, a way to learn um, better or ideally optimal conformal classifiers um, and kind of integrating the, the conformal prediction or generally distribution free statistics a bit more with kind of the deep learning thing that's going on kind of um, at the side there. Um, and um, so if you can't see the slides or anything, just let me know. But I think we, we checked it and it should work. So this is um, uh, based on a recent preprint. Um, and as already mentioned, this was kind of joint work with uh, Thailand, DJ and Arnold from DeepMind. So this was uh, me doing an internship there. And this was also the first time for me actually working on conformal prediction. Um, so yeah, bear with me a bit if, if a lot of the stuff is maybe a bit basic. Um, so I'll start with a short motivation and briefly go over kind of a bit of notation and the conform predictor that we built on. And then I'll kind of spend most of the time actually kind of introducing conformal training and um, yeah, trying to convince you a bit that um, it, it's nice to have this and that you can kind of do interesting stuff like reducing inefficiency or shaping like the confidence sets. And um, yeah, I have a short conclusion and of course, um, feel free to chime in with um, questions if, if anything's unclear or something like that. So let's start with a high level motivation. So for us, I think the main motivation was actually ambiguity. Um, that's uh, all no news to you, I guess. Um, so we were motivated a bit from the medical domain and there you have a lot of ambiguity, for example, by not really knowing the true crown tooth where for example, doctors might actually disagree on kind of the, the underlying crown tooth disease. You have of course, label errors, you have long tail distributions and in the medical domain, as well as many other domains, you are of course making high stakes decisions, right? Where not only doctors, but obviously also the patients are uh, impacted. And yeah, we, we started looking at conformal prediction as a way to capture this ambiguity by moving from like point predictions to set predictions, right? So here we are looking um, exclusively on the classification task, but I think a lot of the, um, the principles I'll talk about can also be applied to, um, the regression, uh, to regression tasks as well. And we understand kind of conformal prediction as this kind of nice wrapper, this nice statistical framework that takes a classifier that obviously makes mistakes occasionally. So as in this example, kind of misclassifying the cat as a dog, um, and then tries to capture the ambiguity um, in, in a set prediction. Um, so here we predict three classes because obviously this seems to be a hard example for the classifier. Um, and ideally, of course, including the true class, in which case we have coverage. And the nice thing um, all of you know, of course, is that usually we have some sort of coverage guarantee, um, even if it's only marginal. Um, and in our work, we mainly focus on kind of this classifier, right? A lot of papers in conform prediction obviously start with, we are giving a classifier and now we are kind of doing fancy stuff. And we kind of looked at uh, how do we actually train this classifier? And the first observation is obviously that this classifier is trained without any knowledge um, about what's going on at test time, right? Uh, kind of the conformalization or the calibration step. Um, and this is a problem because usually we train these classifiers, which might be quite deep models using, for example, course entropy loss. And this does not really relate to any objective that we usually follow in terms of the confidence sets, right? So it's unclear how course entropy loss relates to, for example, inefficiency optimization or something like that. And it also limits us in what we can do because we can't really define losses directly on the confidence sets and kind of train our models to, to optimize these losses. Um, and so this is what we want to address with conformal training. So this is essentially a way, a procedure to train the conformal wrapper with the classifier end to end. Um, so we want to define a loss. So this is kind of depicted here. We want to define a loss on the confidence sets and backprop the gradients through the conformal wrapper and the classifier in order to ultimately update the classifier parameters. And um, I also want to mention that this is just a training procedure. So after training, we recalibrate again using any conformal predictor that, um, that we've seen so far. And um, this way we can kind of preserve the coverage guarantee or even get kind of all the guarantees um, that, that we are able to get um, depending on, on the approach that you want to use. Um, so before going a bit more into detail, let me just introduce um, a bit of notation here. So um, yeah, we assume that we have a classifier pi, which uh, for simplicity just uh, approximates the posterior distribution of classes y given the input X. And of course the goal is to construct confidence sets, which I call C. And the confidence sets obviously implicitly depend on the model's parameters theta, right? Um, and we of course assume that we have a held out calibration set. 
um, in order to usually calibrate a threshold or something like that, and that the test distribution and the calibration distribution is the same. And then uh, marginal coverage guarantee um, can be written down like this. So the probability of the true class being in the confidence set is greater or equal of, uh, than one minus alpha. So here alpha denotes the confidence level, which of course is kind of user specified. Um, and then because coverage is guaranteed and the model is assumed fixed, uh, what we're interested in, uh, at least for the, for the first part of the talk is um, reducing inefficiency, right? So getting uh, meaningful but small confidence sets. Um, I can skip that. Um, and we built on a very simple threshold conform predictor that was introduced very early. I think um, one uh, more recent paper on it was the paper by Zadina et al. Um, but in general, yeah, I want to stress that kind of the following discussion is more or less agnostic to the conformal predictor you use or kind of how you compute your conformity scores. Um, but for simplicity, I just want to introduce the threshold conformal predictor just because kind of a lot of experiments are built on top of that. So um, yeah, we compute conformity scores E, which in this case is just the posterior probabilities. But of course, these can be different. This can be logits, log probabilities, any other scores. Um, and we threshold then using the threshold tau. And then for uh, calibration, we determine the threshold tau using the conformity scores on the calibration set. So on a calibration set, we obviously use the true label. So we compute the conformity scores with respect to the true label and then compute the alpha quantile. And then obviously by construction on the calibration set, we have coverage one minus alpha. And then the nice thing about statistics, uh, as long as the distribution stays the same, we also have coverage one minus alpha on test examples. So this is, um, uh, I think it should be clear to most of you, uh, maybe a justification of why we use kind of the simple threshold conform predictor. Um, so the main idea here was that it's very easy to use and implement. It will also be very easy to differentiate through it later. So which was of course also a um, important reason. Um, and it's applicable to kind of log probabilities to logits um, alike. And um, for the first part, part which kind of um, focuses a bit on inefficiency, the threshold conform predictor is known to kind of optimize inefficiency for a fixed model. Um, but as I said, the presentation is kind of a bit agnostic, right? So you can use um, APS, you can use a regularized APS or any other conformity score that you're interested in. Um, this is um, true at test time, right? So I'm talking at test time now. During training, however, we can also, as long as we find smooth variants of those, we can also um, change that. So yeah, just to recapitulate, recapitulate here, strengths of conformal prediction are obviously, or in my opinion, mainly two points. Most of you might know better than me um, that it's independent of the data distribution, which is nice and we don't want to change anything about that. And that we can use it as kind of a wrapper, right? Which on first sight looks um, very meaningful because we can use all these pre-trained models and we don't need to kind of consider training our own image net models. But um, yeah, in our opinion, this is kind of a big drawback, right? And the main reason for that is obviously that the classifier cannot really adapt to whatever conformity scores you use at test time for conformalization. Um, and this kind of assumes that it's not important how you train a classifier, but if we are honest with ourselves, it really is important, right? The classifier still has a very significant impact on how your conform predictor behaves, right? And I'm not even getting into the details in terms of coverage, but just looking at inefficiency, it's very easy to see that higher accuracy will result in lower inefficiency and vice versa. So we have an interest in kind of learning about how to train these models appropriately for specific conform predictors at test time. And that's, that, lead, that leads us to conformal training. Um, so the high level idea is- um, uh, David? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a qu quick question about the previous slide. Um, when you say yeah. accuracy, I assume you mean the accuracy of like the pre-trained uh, classifier on the on a yeah. fixed data set. Um, yeah, exactly. Maybe that was a bit uh, a bit misleading here. So the accuracy is kind of the top one accuracy on the the posterior probabilities. So without any confidence sets. Um, okay. So in that case, like uh, this trade-off is like not super obvious to me. So assume that the classifier is like one hundred percent accurate. Um, in that case, the top one accuracy, meaning like the set, the set, the optimal set size that you would achieve is like one. Uh, yeah. Even if you, um, even if you have conformal prediction on top of it, we can argue that like, uh, depending on the distribution and things, you can still achieve a set size of one. Um, yeah. So like, how is, so can you kind of like 
intuitively explain this trade-off? I guess it's not super obvious to me. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, maybe for me it's a bit more obvious because I come from kind of the empirical side. Um, and it's just based on the observation that if I train a model on Cypher 10 and the more accurate, like as you said, right? So the more accurate the model is, the more kind of singleton confidence sets I can use with coverage, right? So just by that observation, I can kind of reduce the inefficiency just because I have more singleton sets. Um, I'm not trying to oh, make sorry, a general- Yes, yes, yeah. I, I think, I, I think I, there's a, the inefficiency is lower. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So exactly. I, there was a double. There's a double negative there. I confused that. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank sorry you. about. Right. So we want to have the inefficiency low, and so maybe I should have put kind of test error here, and then it's a bit. Yeah. Uh, you don't have a twist. But yeah. Um. But yeah. Just to recapitulate on that. So I don't want to make a general kind of statement here, right? It's more kind of an intuitive, um, um observation that generally, if if you, for example, use the threshold conform predictor, which optimizes inefficiency. And it has, has a direct relationship to the predicted posterior probabilities. It's kind of intuitive to assume that the better your posterior, the better you approximate your posterior distribution, the smaller your inefficiency and the yep. higher your accuracy, right? Um, but you can, you you could kind of generalize this to other things. Generally, kind of the main message here is, I think that um, the classifier performance is not decoupled from whatever performance you expect from your conformal predictor. May it be inefficiency? May it be any other predictor? And I think usually we kind of assume that it is kind of distinct to some extent by saying that we have given a conform classifier and the black box and we don't care about how it was trained. But in, in reality, obviously it has a significant impact. And I think that's the main point I want to bring across here. So I, I, I hope that um, clarified it a bit. Cool, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so having established that, um, the main idea of conformal training is actually very simple. And it just, um, why don't we consider the conformal wrapper or the conformal predictor during the training process, right? So the idea is to allow um, to train through the conformal wrapper, right? So instead of kind of training on the posterior probabilities, for example, using cross entropy loss, we want to predict the confidence sets during training, then define some sort of loss directly on the confidence sets and backprop this loss. And obviously in this case, we then need to backprop not only through the classifier, but also through the conformal predictor, right? So that's the high level idea. Um, just a couple of um, important notes here before I go into the details. First of all, um, um, this kind of allows very general losses on the confidence sets, right? And the nice thing is that the classifier then is directly trained to optimize these losses and there's kind of no gap uh, between training the classifier and applying the conform training, uh, the conform predictor anymore. And second, it's only a training procedure, right? So of course we make assumptions, so I will, introduce which conformal predictor we use during training. But I want you to keep in mind that after training, we can still tr treat the model somehow as a black box and apply any other conformal predictor that you want to use, right? So if you're interested in, let's say, class conditional uh, coverage, we don't necessarily need to, need to train with a conformal predictor for class conditional coverage. You can still apply it at test time. And in this way, um, conform training is actually very, very general and, and very flexible. So let's go uh, into the details. So, the core idea is that on each mini batch, so I assume kind of SGD, standard SGD training of, of your favorite um, deep network. Um, and the idea is that we want to simulate conformal prediction on each mini batch, right? So we are given a couple of examples X, we forward them through our model. Until then, everything's differentiable, everything's fine. We have our posterior probabilities, and then we split the mini batch in two halves as we would, to, would at test time, right? The calibration step, and the prediction step, and in the prediction step, we then also have a loss computation. The first observation is, of course, as I said before, we need to have differentiable implementations here, right? So let's briefly talk about that. Um, so making the prediction step differentiable is usually straightforward if we assume that we can make the conformity scores differentiable, right? So for the threshold conformal predictor, this is obviously straightforward because these are just the posterior probabilities, or in this case, we actually use the log probabilities because we usually have nicer gradients for that, right? And then the only thing that's left is a thresholding operation with the um, threshold tau, and we can approximate that using kind of a sigmoid function and the temperature. And obviously for the temperature approaching zero, we kind of recover the half thresholding, right? So now just to be a bit clearer on notation here, um, I'm kind of misusing notation here a bit because C where the confidence sets before, now C is kind of a vector and the elements in the vector are kind of soft assignments, right? So you can understand um, each element in C as um, indicating the probability of including class K in the confidence set, right? And then the second part 
the calibration step usually just needs an uh, alpha quantile computation because we assume that the conformity scores are differentiable. And you can use, so there are various approaches out there for doing smooth sorting. And as soon as you can do smooth sorting, you can also do a smooth quantile computation. Um, an example would be the work by Blondell et al. Um, and again, there you have a hyperparameter epsilon, which again um, can be used to, um, to, um, to control the, the approximation quality, right? So in both of these cases, if T and epsilon approach zero, you basically recover the hard counterpart of the threshold conformal predictor, in this case on log probabilities. Hey, hey, okay. Dave. Yeah. Um, so this is the this seems like the critical part of the talk. So I want to make sure I understand it. Um, so first sure. of all, uh, the way that it's written now, it looks like sigma of blah 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 is a number between zero and one. Exactly. Is that true? That's yeah. not a vector. Yeah, so, but we do this for every class, right? So you have the class index K here. I see. And you have the class, so P, so theta are always the parameters, right? So PK is the posterior probability or the, the approximated, the predicted posterior okay. probability of class K given input X, right? And then if we do a soft thresholding here, we get the Kth entry in this kind of soft, um, soft assignment of C, right? So what you're basically computing is, it's of course not kind of the same, but you can, because it's between zero and one, you can interpret it as a probability of including class K in your confidence set, right? Wow. And with T approaching zero, you have kind of a hard assignment. So you are moving to a zero one vector and the zero one vector could be interpreted as just um, um, encoding your set, right? Encoding your confidence set in zeros and ones. I see. So at the end of this, you expect your classifier, which is pi theta comma K of X, to have learned, I guess, the function e to the proper probability? Is that what, what you're No, we, I, to be honest, I haven't really, haven't really thought about that. Um, so the main idea is, so if you treat, uh, if you were to replace p by the conformity scores, right? So if you put e here, then I think the goal would be that the classifier learns to optimize your conformity scores in order to get confidence sets that that are desirable to you, depending on what loss you use in the end, right? Um, I just simplified it a bit, it a bit in the case in that I directly plug in the log probabilities as conformity scores. But uh -huh. you could do, for example, we did in the paper, you could plug in the APS conformity scores here, right, in okay. a differentiable uh -huh. manner. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question, right? But I'll um, also kind of reflect on that later on. Uh, yeah, okay. so I can, can I also ask a follow up to that question? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'm wondering, like, if you get the base probability here, like, suppose you predict the true probability of pi given x, uh, does that generally maximize your objective? Um, this depends on the objective that you're interested in. I didn't really talk about that yet, right? So if we are talking about um, reducing inefficiency and we consider the threshold conformal predictor, then kind of the predicting the perfect, the true posterior pro um, probabilities would probably reduce your inefficiency, right? If, if you assume that your task, for example, is per perfectly separable and you can get like 100% accuracy, then the corresponding predictions would, of course, always result in an inefficiency of one, right? But if you're, um, but if you're for example, assuming that your task is not separable, right? So you can't get an inefficiency of one because you can't get an accuracy of 100%. Um, then you might have other objectives, right? So your objective might not only be to reduce inefficiency, but you might have other constraints. And um, I have a couple of examples later. So um, maybe, maybe, maybe we can kind of go on and you can um, see if the objectives I talk about later kind of make sense to you. And then we can, um, uh, we, we can recapitulate, uh, recapitulate then. Uh, okay, sounds good. Did, did that answer that somehow? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to just follow up on yeah. that because I think uh, getting the base optimal is sort of the best thing you can do, but not if you if you use threshold um, threshold functions as the conformity scores. Um, so, like I think that within this threshold framework, maybe base optimal is not the best. But if you did have the base optimal, then you would con um, produce the set in a different way, uh, which was I think done in one of the one of the papers which you mentioned. Um, and and like maybe in this case, like if you do, even if you have the base optimal, the the classifier will take some back prop steps, or your your optimization will move. Yeah, 
I yeah, that's, that's, that's a good comment. Surprising. Yeah, but thanks for the pointer. So, so like yeah. even if you have the base predictor, you might not want to use it when you do say threshold based scaffold prediction. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm not too much into details there. So maybe somebody else knows the details. But I think in the in the Zadina paper that I mentioned earlier, um, they have an argument like that that depending on what you uh, optimize, then is the threshold actually the most efficient or not? Um, but yeah, I'm not. I think I'm not the best person to uh, to ask here. Maybe just to to round this out um, yeah. before we move on. I think that uh, one of the most interesting parts uh, about this paper to me is that it seems like the you know, depending on what conformal score you use in your conformal training pipeline, the classifier will end up having properties that depend on what optimizes that score. Yeah. So you're not, as I think Chirag was bringing up, you're not actually optimizing to get the best base classifier anymore, which introduces some yeah. sorts of interesting questions as to what ends up happening when you've optimized for a particular score. Um, and that, and that's something we might want to discuss during our discussion period. Yeah, definitely. I mean, happy to discuss that. We didn't really do lots of experiments that, but I'm I'm sure I have some some insights on that um, later on because, as I said earlier, we tried the special conform predictor, but we, for example, also tried APS. Um, and we, of course, at test time again, you have the same decision to make, right? Which predictor you use, and then it's interesting to see which combinations actually um, result in which which results. Um, okay. So yeah, that's that's what I wanted to mention in this additional point here, right? So you can do the same for, I think, a lot of conformal predictors, um, such as APS, regularized APS, and so on, as long as you come up, uh, can come up with kind of a smooth approximation. In experiments, we found, of course, that not all the smooth approximations might work well during training, right? So there is, of course, you need to consider gradient flow and so on. Um, that's why I presented the log probabilities as a very easy method, which also provides very good, good gradient, right? Because log probabilities are very close to cross entropy training in terms of so the um, in terms of training dynamics, right? So your hyperparameters might um, transfer quite well. Um, okay. I'm not sure exactly what nonconformity scores were presented in these papers, but I just had a quick follow up um, about whether you need the nonconformity score only to depend on the prediction for the class K, or could it also depend on the predictions for the other classes? So I know of at least one. Uh, non-conformity score where it does, I think it's the Romano, but I'm so, not sure. So, yeah, APS, so by Romano at all, uh, depends on, so they basically sort the probabilities of all classes and then computer conformity scores. So on average, your conformity score depends on multiple posterior probabilities, right? Um, so that's definitely possible, right? So it doesn't really matter which classes it depends on. The only important thing is that whatever you compute, the conformity score that you compute needs to be differentiable with respect to the predictions, right? But it can be differentiable with respect to all predictions and not only the predictions to one class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, let's let's plug these two things in. Um, so yeah, we, we already discussed quite a bit now. So um, the calibration step is, is easy in the regard that it's only a smooth alpha contract computation. Again, I'm kind of assuming your log probabilities as conformity scores here, but again, you can replace these by others. And the important thing is that now the threshold you calibrate is differentiable um, with respect to the classifiers parameters through the conformity scores, right? Through the predicted posterior probabilities. Um, and then in the prediction step, we plug in kind of the soft assignment C. Again, this is a kind of a, a soft thresholding operations. And now it's um, important to remember that this is again differentiable with respect to the parameters, but it's, it has basically two ways to go, right? First of all, it's differentiable with respect to the posterior probabilities on this second half of the batch, right? And um, even more, it's differentiable through the threshold tau with respect to the predictions on the first half of the batch, right? And then uh, what we do is we, we take these soft assignments and we can kind of define a loss on these soft assignments and we can differentiate or we can backprop these gradients not only through the prediction step but also through the calibration step and the classifier and update the classifier's parameters accordingly. Um, okay, so let's, before we talk about the losses and the objectives, let's briefly kind of um, talk about the coverage guarantee um, because I think that th th there can be some confusion here. So there are two things to distinguish, right? So we have the training phase and we have the test phase. During training, the prediction and calibration steps are approximated in a smooth way, right? So the approximation, of course, doesn't offer any coverage guarantee. Maybe it does, but we didn't really kind of go down this route and, and try to um, 
kind of narrow down what your selector might be, right? So how much coverage you might lose. Um, but I want to mention that again, like for T and epsilon approaching zero, we of course recover the original counterparts and the original counterpart offer coverage. So what we observed in, uh, observe in, in practice is that um, for reasonable T and epsilon, we get empirical coverage close to the coverage guarantee, right? But we don't have a coverage guarantee per se. And it seems that during training, this is sufficient, right? So we, in our experience, we don't need coverage guarantee to make this kind of trainable. And then at test time, this is of course the, the more interesting part because um, the coverage guarantee gets, in my opinion, only relevant at the test time. And so after training, we can again, and I, I stress that a couple of times, we can use any conformal predictor to recalibrate as we would before. We can use the threshold predictor, can use APS, regularized APS, um, um, whatever you, you basically are interested in, right? And then the important thing to note is you get the coverage guarantee as stated in the corresponding work, right? So our kind of conformal training does not have any impact on the kind of coverage guarantee that you can get or not. Um, and maybe a side note, what we usually do is usually we train. So what we experimented with is obviously having roughly the same Perform predictor at training and test time. And then we usually also use the same confidence level at training and test time. Um, although I will have a couple of results indicating that this actually generalizes to other confidence levels at test time. Okay, so yeah, here's everything put together. I just want to highlight this point again, right? So because we calibrate on the first half of the batch uh, and we use smooth operations, we don't have a coverage guarantee on the second half of the batch, but empirically, so if you just print it out and compute it during training, you have an empirical coverage close to one minus alpha. And you can just do this by kind of thresholding the soft assignments, right? And then you get kind of hard confidence sets. And you can just empirically print out your coverage. And um, we observe that this is usually close to one minus alpha, um, which will become important if we talk about what loss to apply. Okay, so let's uh, finally um, um, start talking about losses. So I have two parts here. The first part is the straightforward one is just reducing inefficiency, right? And the second part is more kind of broadly talking about what else we can do with this um, new approach. Um, I'll have some experiments on shaping the class conditional inefficiency dis uh, distribution, and I'll have some experiments on actually influencing the composition of these confidence sets. So let's start with inefficiency. Um, yeah, I probably don't need to stress this here, but obviously coming from, from medical domain, um, a lower inefficiency um, while coverage is guaranteed always results in lower uncertainty and lower uncertainty always results in better resource um, um, allocation, right? So the doctor has to spend less time, the patient doesn't have to um, undergo unnecessary tests and so on, right? So inefficiency, uh, as I said, I don't probably don't need to convince you, but inefficiency is of course an important aspect to optimize. Um, so how we do this in practice through conformal training is actually very simple. Um, we just define a loss. In this case, I call a loss omega. And the loss is very simple. It just sums all the soft assignments over all classes, right? So let's um, think about what this actually means. Um, as before, these soft assignments, they are in 0, 1. They can be interpreted as the probability of including k in the confidence set, right? Um, and then if we just sum up over these soft assignments, um, this sum can be interpreted as kind of an approximation of the expected inefficiency, right? So what we are essentially doing here is we are trying to directly minimize as a loss the expected inefficiency for each confidence set, right? Also note that we don't use the true label here, right? This is because even though we don't have a coverage guarantee during training, we do observe that empirically we have good coverage on the second half of the batch. So by reducing just inefficiency, it turns out that this is kind of enough incentive for the model to produce meaningful posterior probabilities or meaningful conformity scores um, in order to also have a reasonable accuracy in the end. Okay, um, let's look at how this looks. So this Sorry, is for- can you go back yeah. one slide? Yeah, of course. Looking at this, this loss function, this loss function, so, uh, C of theta comma K is a vector, one for each class. You know, you give X, yeah. it gives you a vector of sort of log probabilities or something um, for each class, right? Um, but why would you, so there's one of those is the true class, right? One of those is class Y. Well, are so, you, are you minimum, are you, why are you penalizing that if you are? So um, first of all, and maybe to clarify this, so C are kind of not the posterior probabilities, right? So these are, Kind of you can think of a 
um, vector. And if I have a one in the vector, it's very likely that this class will be included in a confidence set, but I can have multiple values close to one and multiple values close to zero, right? So if I now, um, so if I now sum up and these, these values would always be zero or one, then I would compute the exact inefficiency, right? It's basically just like a Delta Dirac of checking whether class K is in the confidence set, right? But because these are soft, these are soft assignments, we basically sum over them, right? I'm not sure if that clarified it, but. We can talk about it later. I, I think I might still have a question. Yeah, no, go on. Let's clarify it now. Others might have the same question. Oh, I, I guess in this sum, yeah. Like, what I mean, what should you be doing intuitively? Intuitively to get what you want, it seems to me that what you should do is you should take C sub theta comma Y and make that big and C sub theta comma everything else and make it small. But yeah, yeah, this, true. This loss function doesn't, doesn't seem to do that. And I'm wondering- No, no, it doesn't. Um, and this is kind of where the trick comes in. The trick is that because we have coverage close to one minus alpha. So even though it's only empirical, Right. Let's assume for one second that we actually get a coverage guarantee on the second batch. Right. What a coverage guarantee means is that one minus in one minus alpha percent of the cases, the true class is included in the confidence set, mean, meaning the true class, so C theta comma Y is very close to one. Right. So now you're summing overall. So if you just if you just um, if you just compute uh, if you just predict the true label then the sum will be close to one. But now if you predict kind of multiple labels in your set, then you will have something larger than one, right? So this is actually, so maybe I simplified it too much. So what you can actually do here, instead of the sum, you have a hinge loss, right? So you have a max of one comma this sum. And then you have a bit what you said, right? You don't want to penalize the model for including the true class. You only want to penalize the model for including any additional classes, right? So in practice, what we also do is we have this kind of max of uh, one comma this approach. Uh, in practice, this one can be a hyperparameter, right? So you can also try, it, you, you can of course try to penalize the model for including one class. Um, but the important point is that why this works is the combination of having coverage of one minus alpha on the second half and then reducing inefficiency. And this combination in practice actually turns out to do the trick. If you wouldn't have coverage, then I totally agree. Then you would have, you would need a loss that additionally enforces that the true label is in the set, right? Okay. Yeah. Is there okay. a re so just as a final thing here? Is there a reason why you so I, as I understand, loss functions are allowed to include the true label, right? Yeah, um, of course they are allowed, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So is there any reason why you didn't? Why you chose to do this with the hinge loss instead of incorporating the true label? Um, well, the first thing was kind of simplicity, and I'll show in a minute that including a classification loss actually has advantages also in terms of inefficiency, right? But with this loss, the nice thing is you don't need to trade off any losses, right? It's just one loss, right? You don't need to kind of, you don't have any additional hyperparameters, and it just optimizes. Um, you have, you, you can think about other advantages. So for example, you can think about a setting where you really don't have the labels on the second half of the batch. Right, so there we get into semi-supervised and we didn't try it, but I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, if you think about trying kind of the minimal thing that works, then that's the minimal thing that works. It's not the best one. And I'll kind of show that in okay. a second. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's basically round that up. So here is, here are results on kind of a couple of different data sets. Um, and at test time, we use the threshold predictor on probabilities. Remember that during training, we use the threshold predictor on log probabilities, right? Um, you can see that we improve the inefficiency slightly on most of the data sets. On fashion MNIST, surprisingly, um, the improvement is a bit better. But yeah, as, um, as we just discussed, um, you can actually improve over that by additionally having a classification loss. And I'll kind of show the details in a second. Um, and then you actually get improvements across the board. And these are kind of a bit smaller on Cypher 10. The main reason, or Cypher 10 and Cypher 100, the main reason for that is that on these data sets, we actually use pre-trained features, right? So it's um, the pre-trained features are, of course, trained using cross entropy, and we just train kind of a final layer on top. But you can see on the other data sets, you have improvements. And then I think the main, sorry, the main point I want to bring across is that you can use different conformal predictors at test time. So you can use APS. You could also use regularized APS and so on. And then use uh, for APS, for example, the improvements are way more significant, which is, of course, partly due to the fact that APS is less efficient to start with, right? So inefficiency is higher for the baseline as well. So there's more room for improvement, 
but you can see that now the improvements are quite significant across the board, right? So the main message here is that we can improve in efficiency depending, of course, a bit on your data set, depending on the conformal predictor that you're interested in, right? Um, then maybe one interesting thing is that this actually generalizes to lower confidence levels at test time, right? So we do 1% confidence level at training time, but at test time, we might actually, because we have, for example, more calibration data, we might actually say we want to have lower ones. And you can see that the inefficiency improvement still generalizes quite well. So this is for the threshold predictor. Um, and of course, the, the relative improvement gets a bit smaller because you can think that it's that the model is not really trained for these low confidence levels, but it still works. The other way around, I'm not showing this, the other way around is a bit more difficult. So if you train with 1% confidence level and you evaluate at five, then the inefficiency improvements might not be as significant or you, you don't have an efficiency improvement at all. Um, I won't show results for that, but another nice thing about conformal training is that you can very easily conformalize ensembles, right? So I know that there are, um, ensemble conformal predictors out there that try to select the most efficient model among an ensemble. And with conformal training, you can kind of avoid that and just train a linear model on top of the logits and directly optimize the ineff efficiency. Okay. Um, um, hi, yeah, uh, yeah. David. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so going back to your results on uh, your improvements on inefficiency, yeah. Um, yeah. so at the end of the day, when you optimize this objective, you're going to be eventually back back propagating into your model conditional probabilities um in in, in whatever case in the, th in the thresholding case so when you design say a control predictor using something like what romano uses like aps like there's also additional sort of advantageous properties such as it sort of converges to good conditional coverage if you have good approximation yeah. of those conditional properties so i'm curious to see like what are you sort of sacrificing when you optimize, say, for a general efficiency here? Like, because you're sort of losing that sort of formulation, which you can sort of show converges in the general case to um, better conditional probabilities. Do you lose that? Like, are you just sort of flattening out the inefficient sort of extra logics that also incorporate some uncertainty for those corner cases? Or what's can you measure at all like what the difference is in terms of worst case conditional coverage or, or metrics like that? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we don't have that in the paper because it wasn't kind of the biggest focus for us, but you're definitely right, right? So if I improve the inefficiency, I mean, usually you have a trade-off, right? Because if, if you don't have a better model or, uh, or allow kind of a better model, you, can, you kind of have an upper bound on your accuracy and the coverage is guaranteed. So if I have an improvement in inefficiency, it needs to come from somewhere, right? Um, so in this case for APS, for example, you might lose to some extent kind of the nicer properties of APS in terms of, of conditional coverage or something like that. We didn't um, explicitly um, kind of quantize that or measure that empirically in, in, the, um, in the paper uh, with the rationale that you could, I mean, if you are, for example, interested in class conditional coverage, you could as well use a class conditional threshold predictor at test time, independent of what you do at training time, right? So um, you're right, it would be an interesting experiment. Um, would be nice to have it in the appendix, for example, but um, that's all I tell you, uh, I can tell you, right? So we didn't do too much of these experiments. Um, we didn't see kind of a significant drop, but we also didn't consider a lot of conditional uh, coverage formulations, right? So we, we mostly looked at class conditional ones this wasn't a kind of too significant difference there, but I mean, you, you can consider other conditional formulations and maybe maybe you have a bad trade-off there, right? So I, I can't tell you that. Um, yeah, I hope that kind of- Yeah, okay, okay thanks. Yeah, but it's a good point, right? And maybe we can also just discuss later on, on how that pins out. Um, okay, uh, yeah. I, I'm, wondering, um, uh, I'm wondering like how scalable is this method? Because it seems like uh, from the description of the method, you kind of need to take gradients with respect to the training set, right? On the full batch, like because you need to take gradients with respect to the threshold, which depends on like all the data points that you use for recalibration. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so would this be like, uh, can you comment a bit on like how scalable this is? And I think you also mentioned something like uh, you were using pre-trained features for Cypher. Is that also like something that practitioners Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That uh, was uh, was a, a slight trick of me. So, um, uh, okay, two things here. First, scalability depends quite a bit on what kind of smooth sorting approach you use, 
right? So there are these, I mean, smooth sorting has kind of, um, uh, th there are kind of different approaches that you can use and some of them might be more scalable, some less, right? So if we talk about what you would usually do um, in practice is that your full batch would, I mean, large batch training just doesn't work as well, right? So you usually wanna have smaller batches. You need, of course, to have a minimum batch size because if you, if you wanna compute an alpha quantile and your alpha is very small, you need to have kind of a minimum amount of examples there, right? So in our case, for example, you have a batch size of let's say 500 that worked well, right? Then you have 250, for example, that you need to sort. And uh, one important thing here is that the sorting of course only happens on the conformity scores, right? So the sorting is you are sorting 250 values independent of your network architecture and independent of the input dimensionality, right? Even usually it's even independent of the number of classes, right? Because you're really only computing one conformity score. So it's uh, kind of, if you have thousand classes or hundred, the numbers you are sorting only depends on kind of the batch size, right? So in our case, um, this scaled reasonably well, right? So we used batch sizes in between, let's say a hundred and a thousand, and, and we had no problems. Um, then the second point on Cypher, that's a good point, right? So conformal training, depending on how you do it and, and which conformal predictor you use might be a bit more difficult than normal training but of course, normal training, people also spend the, the last 10 years kind of trying to optimize hyperparameters and optimizers and so on, right? So we know how to choose these hyperparameters for normal training. For conformal training on the smaller data set, so if I go to the inefficiency results here, for example, um, on all experiments, uh, on all data sets except Cypher, um, so in the paper, we have a couple of more, uh, we can train models um, entirely from scratch. If we do this on Cypher, you will usually lag a bit in terms of accuracy, especially if you want to train with, let, let's say, state-of-the-art uh, data augmentation, right? So if you just want to train conformal training with auto-augment on Cypher, then you probably have to spend a couple of months and try to come up with good hyperparameters and tune it a bit and um, stuff like that. So what we did is basically we used the pre-trained Cypher 10 model, or we, we trained one ourselves with kind of auto-augment, and then we just fine-tuned the, the last layer. But it's very flexible in the sense that you can also, you could also imagine fine tuning the whole model. You can also imagine training an MLP on top of the features. And as I said before, you can also imagine training like an MLP on an ensemble of Cypher 10, right? But um, this is this is still, this is definitely still a limitation, right? That training from sketch on Cypher and probably more difficult data sets is difficult. Yeah. So you called me there. <laughs> Did that answer uh, the, the yeah, question? I guess that's probably fine because like maybe for yeah. most medical data, they don't have lots of data points. So people use pre-trained models and fine tune them anyways. Yeah, and I mean, it's also nice in terms of flexibility, right? Because you can, so if you have pre-trained models and I mean, let's be honest, nobody from us wants to kind of train the state of the art on ImageNet, right? So usually what you want to do is you want still to adapt the model to your task as much as possible, but you want to reuse as much of the model that's there. And conformal training can do that in a way that you can just kind of train a smaller model on top of features or something like that, right? Um, but it's also a limitation. So you see that the improvements, especially for the threshold conformal predictor on Cypher are the lowest, which kind of tells you a bit that first training the model with cross entropy and then fine tuning using conformal training is not optimal because the, the features are still trained using an objective that doesn't reflect the objective you're interested in, right? So it's all, all, all about trade-offs in that sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, thanks for the great questions, but because we have uh, only 10 minutes left, I'll probably skip one or two parts here. And if people are, um, are interested in that, um, uh, we, can, we can get back to that in a discussion. So if you want to go beyond reducing inefficiency, um, so this is in our case, mostly motivated by, by medical applications. Uh, and here we looked at um, different settings. Um, so the first one um, is, for example, instead of reducing the average inefficiency, you want to reduce inefficiency for specific classes, right? In the medical domain, you want to reduce inefficiency for the low risk cases. So the doctor has to spend less time on those and can kind of allocate more times for the high risk ones, right? And then the second part is not about inefficiency, but about actually influencing the, um, the classes that are included in the confidence sets, right? Um, and without... Uh, yeah, okay, let's let's briefly go over the inefficiency results. And um, yeah, this is probably um, also no news to, to most of you, but obviously inefficiency might vary a lot by class. So this is on Cypher 10. You can see that for 
classes three and four, this is cat and dog. These are kind of usually confused, right? You have quite high inefficiency and using the inefficiency laws I kind of um, presented earlier, you can kind of reduce inefficiency for a specific class just by reweighting, right? So you put a weight term here and the weight term might be higher for class K than for other classes. And so you can reduce um, the inefficiency for that class. And I'll skip Cypher 10 because I think Cypher 100 is a bit more impressive. Um, so what I show here is in blue, the inefficiency improvement per class. Uh, in this case, it's per course class, right? On Cypher 100, you have 20 course classes and each course class has five fine classes, right? And these are 20 different experiments. And for each experiment, we kind of basically put a large weight on inefficiency for this specific course class. And you can see that for all the course classes, we can reduce the inefficiency quite significantly, like 20% or more. And of course, again, there are trade-offs, right? Because coverage stays the same. You usually have a slight increase in the average inefficiency across all classes, right? But I think the main message here is that you can impact, you can influence class conditional inefficiency quite significantly. And the cost you have to pay is um, very marginal in most of the cases. Okay, so this is um, inefficiency. Let's talk about shaping the confidence sets. And this is where the classification loss comes in that, I, uh, that we already discussed earlier, right? Um, and this classification loss is parameterized by a loss matrix L and has these two parts. The first part is essentially what we discussed earlier. The first part enforces that the true class is included in the confidence sets, which means that if you only use the true class, uh, the, the queen part, we basically enforce coverage, right? So this is a coverage loss. Um, but we also have this second part here, the red part. And the red part can be used to penalize the model of including other classes in the confidence set, right? And I think this is where the loss becomes interesting. So just um, for simplicity, right? So if we pick the loss matrix L as the identity, we just have the queen part, it's just a coverage loss. But if we also have a non-zero entry um, on the off diagonal, we can, for example, penalize the model from including class K in the confidence sets of class um, Y, right? Of true class Y. Um, so as an example here, um, we might consider kind of reducing what, what I call coverage confusion, right? So similar to classification confusion, you can look at confidence sets and you can, you can kind of calculate how often is class six, um, which is a shirt, included in confidence sets with true class four, which is coat, right? On fashion ambits, right? And maybe because these, these are kind of easy, easily confused, maybe you want to penalize the model for confusing these classes. And this is what we can do with the classification loss by kind of introducing these off diagonal weights. And you can see the larger the off diagonal weights, the lower the coverage confusion uh, gets, right? So this is kind of a relative change. So we can reduce the coverage confusion by almost 1% in both cases. But again, you have a trade-off. In this case, the trade-off is that you have more confusion between classes two and four. So we might of course go ahead and say, okay, we also want to avoid confusion between classes two and four and six. So two is pullover here. And again, the colored lines show you that we can achieve nearly a 1% reduction in confusion in all of these cases. But again, you have a trade-off. In this case, the trade-off is um, some unrelated classes, right? Um, okay, so this is kind of an idea or it gives you an idea of um, what we can do um, statistically um, on, the, on the confidence set, right? That we can really kind of penalize the model of including specific combinations of classes in the confidence sets. Um, and I'll skip this for now to leave a bit of a room for discussion um, and conclude here. So yeah, so the main point of conformal training is that we kind of have this end-to-end -end training mechanism for classifier and conformal wrapper. Again, I want to emphasize that this is very flexible in terms of the conformal predictor that we use at test time. Um, and so we retain any coverage guarantee that is provided by the conformal predictor at test time. We can reduce inefficiency um, using an inefficiency loss. However, using this additional classification loss, we can also do kind of more interesting stuff like um, reducing class conditional inefficiency, um, reducing coverage confusion, and many more. And in general, of course, using this framework, you can kind of see that um, if you have a, a, another application specific loss that is kind of not, uh, or that you can formulate in terms of our classification loss, um, this is, of course, also something you, you could try to train with. Um, okay, a bit of an outlook, but I think we, we covered that to quite some extent. But the main point here is, of course, that the interesting part is now trying different combinations of how you train and how you test, right? 
So for example, reducing the class conditional inefficiency gets particularly interesting when you at the same time have a conformal predictor that ensures class conditional coverage, right? Um, another direction would be um, actually not having a coverage guarantee at test time, but having also a guarantee on an application specific loss at test time, and then trying to match the loss that you want to have a guarantee at test time to the loss that you're actually optimizing during training, right? So I think there are kind of a lot of exciting um, um, experiments to run um, and, and future directions here. Um, but yeah, I'll stop here. We already had kind of a lot of good questions, but um, yeah, if you have comments, questions, feel free to, um, to, uh, to, to ask them. <laughs>